Hi, I'm Tamsin Webster, and I'm about to have a productive conversation with Mike Barney. Welcome to A Productive Conversation. I'm Mike Vardy, and I'm joined by Tamsin Webster on today's program. She's the author of the new book, Say What They Can't Unhear, The Nine Principles of Lasting Change. Now, when we did this recording, which I literally just finished moments ago, the thought was that this episode wasn't going to be released until after the book was out. But turns out we're going to release it beforehand so you can pre-order the book now, and that way you can get it in your hands. And then what we talk about during the conversation today, which includes the principles discussed, which ones were maybe the toughest to kind of for people to crack. Uh, we talked about communication in general. We talked about the body of work that Tamsin's put together over the years, especially considering, uh, you know, her, her background as a leading messaging strategist, keynote speaker, and also the author of uh, Find Your Red Thread. So much that we get into. Uh, we had a great time conversing. Wish we had more time. We didn't, but there's lots of greatness in this productive conversation today. So without further ado, here is my conversation with Tamsin Webster for you to enjoy here on the podcast, a productive conversation at that. Enjoy. Tamsin, thanks so much for taking the time to join me today. We just had a little bit of a warm up before we hit record, you know. Absolutely. Talking coast. to you on the other side of the coast. <laughs> pretty much, pretty much. It's been a long time since I've been out to your neck of the woods. It sounds like you've been to my neck of the woods a few more, few more times uh, than, yeah. than I've been out to yours. Yeah. Um, it, you know, I wanted to dive into, obviously that we've, you've got the, the book that as of this episode being released is out, but as we're recording this, it's on its way and it, you're in the home stretch. Uh, see, they can't unhear the nine yeah. principles of lasting change. As I went through the book and, and looking at your body of work, you know, you know, you, you'd find your red thread, right? Which was the, the book that kind of, um, as I mentioned to you before we hit record. Uh, my friend was like, oh, I love that book. And, and you know, like it, it basically the idea of crafting communication and big ideas, you know, in, in a way that resonates things more deeply. Right. You know, this idea of going deep when you're making this shift to this new this other book, which is related to a degree. How were, did you have to do a lot of untethering of of things as you were kind of going into the process of writing this book? Or does it just feel like it's a natural progression of your body of work in general. Yeah, it's a it's definitely a natural progression and it's essentially was you know, I th it, the more that I put find your red thread out there and the more that I was doing some of kind of newer work that that fits along with the the methodology I put in in that book. Uh, and the more I was realizing I'm like, you know what? Just to, I I think I think I think about this stuff differently than other people. And I know that sounds strange, but sometimes it takes a little while to figure out that you're like, oh, my goodness, everyone doesn't. Oh, OK. People aren't looking at this idea, these ideas of, you know, driving action versus driving change. And, you know, I but I was talking to people who in the context of influence and persuasion and that kind of thing kind of really were not satisfied with what they took away from a lot of the information that's out there, which. I like to say it kind of feels like it falls in one of two camps, like ick or stick, meaning like ick, ugh, I don't like how it feels. It feels manipulative or coercive. Or then the stick camp, it's all about, you know, rewards and punishments. Right. And I, I was like, well, hey, I'm I'm with that too. And so um, you know, some of the principles that appeared in Find Your Red Thread find their way here too. But this is really a capturing of truly like 25 years worth of my processing all the information I found in different places uh, about change communication. And generally, these are my go-to and the ones that I would share with my clients about, you know, these are the things we need to know about how people decide, stay decided, <laughs> mm -hmm. how they change, how they don't change, where we get it wrong, uh, even if unintentionally. Uh, and just decided to put that all into a book to really just say, hey, this is this is a different way to approach this. So if you've been trying to do this before and you haven't been happy with the results or you haven't been happy with how it felt to get the results that you were getting, you know, I wanted to present an alternative for that. When you go through the book, you talk about the nine principles. And one of the things I always kind of look at when when I see a framework is 
is it sequential or is it parallel or like which one is and there's a lot of people who when they go through books like this they'll go from cover to cover mm. and and kind of enact it in a step by step way yeah from what i gathered as i was going through the book there are elements of that for sure but it doesn't mm. feel like there is you know, you spend this much time on this step and this much time. There's a lot of moving and, and I mean, there's a lot of flow that happens. Yeah. Yeah. Because I don't really see it as a as a framework. To me, it's much more of an ecosystem, whereas sure. find, find Your Red Thread is definitely a linear framework, though it can be done in any order. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, fun, fundamentally, by the time you finish a communication in the, you know, in the Red Thread method, you know, there is a beginning, a middle and an end to it. Mm -hmm. But these principles are really about you just they're a, they are it taken together are what raise the probability of success right and so i i'm delighted that you saw that a they do build on each other if you read them sequentially but i also wrote them so that you could hop around uh follow the path of the one that 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 intrigued you or angered you or surprised you or whatever it might be, I really wanted people to start where they would consider or what seemed most initially resonant to them and mm -hmm. then proceed from there. Uh, when I was going through the intro, the first thing you start talking about is the ding that, that showed yes. up. Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't ding. help. Yeah. Well, and, <laughs> so and, I had and fun and with my audio book with that too. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that's great. That's great. Um, in, in, you know, as a reader, when you're reading it, you, obviously the reader is kind of trying to put themselves in the shoes of the author and, and, and it helps you relate. I couldn't help but relate to that because, and I alluded to this before we hit record, this idea of comedians, you know, as someone who works in comedy and who, you know, has done that, they tend to look at everything through the lens as how is that funny? How can I make mm -hmm. that funny? Right. And yeah. when I was reading that part of the book, it felt like that your way of operating, it's almost like, and it's not, it's not, um, it's not overt, but it's always like below the, the surface of mm. everything that you're kind of looking at is through that, that lens creeps in there. Do you find oh, that, that, yeah. that happens? Okay. Okay. Yeah. That, that's <laughs> very insightful. I mean, I, it's, it, I, yes, I absolutely, that is an accurate statement to say that I listen with, uh, I listen in layers. Um, mm. I, I mean, some of that's related to childhood trauma. I mean, it's not actual trauma. It's just, have you ever heard of this kind of framework of thinking about different family cultures as cultures of askers and guessers? Have you ever heard this? No, I haven't. So this was a, yeah, there's a way back, I think in like 2007, I could be wrong. There's an Atlantic article on it. There's a Guardian article on it, but it, it, the, the original source is askmetafilter.com. And somebody responded saying, oh, it looks like you've got a conflict between ask culture and guess culture. Um, and the, the quick version of it is, is that in guest culture families, you only say what you want out loud if you're pretty sure you're going to get a yes. Yeah. Otherwise, you are waiting for somebody to guess what it is that you want. That was pretty much everybody in my family, except for me. Um, so because I guessed wrong a lot. <laughs> and so I don't know if it was a coping mechanism or something else, but I was definitely either wired to be or quickly learned to be an asker where I would just ask for what I wanted. And if I don't get it, fine, whatever. I'm just going to ask because at least I'm not putting somebody else in the position of guessing all the time. Um, so, you know, the thing is, is that while that may have been you know, difficult, as a child, um, it actually did, in fact, train me to be kind of listening at both the level of what is said and what is meant. Right. And, you know, it, with the work that I do in message design, like that's it comes in handy um, because, you know, oftentimes, you know, another great dichotomy I ran across recently was that a lot of times we end up with things that are, you know, words and concepts that are correct but they're not precise. Mm. And, and when they're not precise, we get all sorts of bad stuff, right? Yeah. We, we don't, stuff. we don't like nuance. We don't like nuance is such a tricky it cause, and, and, you know, I've actually been thinking about this a lot, the idea of precision and productivity, because mm. it's so hard to get there. And yet a lot of things are, you know, uh, 
kind of cultivated around like being precise with time and being precise with action. And to me, it's more about like, what's your tolerance? Like what's the range, right? Because to me that, you know, that, and when you hear the term tolerant, well, well, but you're right. Like in engineering, there's this great book called, I think it's called the perfectionist and it's about engineering and how I think Simon Winchester wrote it, I believe. Um, He also wrote the book called the timekeepers, which is another great book where he just dives into the history of like, the making of time, which of course I went down. But this idea of perfectionism, where it was like the word nerdery, which I know you can appreciate is like, what's accuracy versus precision? How do you Mm -hmm. determine accuracy is, is, is being accurate, objective or subjective? It can depend, right? So there's so many things there. And, and to your point, this idea of being precise with, with language, with, with many things, that that struggle or that desire or that even compulsion to get there is often our undoing, I think, right? Because we, instead of asking or get, or maybe asking the yeah. right questions or getting more information and not just general information, but the right information. Yeah. See, and I have a very strong bent towards efficiency. I mean, mm-hmm. one of the, <laughs> uh-huh. uh, I don't talk about this. I may have talked about this in the first book. So I think one of the ways to get at some of these deeper principles that I talk about in the book for yourself is to pay attention, for instance, to um, like proverbs and axioms that really ring true for you, the ones that you say to yourself all the time. So I remember when I had this this insight, you know, a number of years ago now, and I was like, well, now that I've said that out loud, I was like, you know, one of the ones that I really subscribe to is that a stitch in time saves nine. Mm -hmm. Like, I'd rather spend a little bit more work now and get it get it right, or at least do the best thing, than wait too long, do the wrong thing and have to do nine times more work later. That's not fun for me. Um, So I turned to my husband, Tom, and I was like, what's yours? And he was like, the second mouse gets the cheese. Oh, I I love that one. Love that one. And I was like, this explains so much of our, like, uh, only occasional intermarital conflict. Um, You know, it's like, because, you know, so my whole point with all of this was really to figure out, like, what do you need to know up front so Mm -hmm. that you can avoid avoidable pitfalls so that you can, you know, as far as I'm concerned, when it comes to being precise like does it take effort absolutely is it effort that will pay off because you will get to you know to use kind of salesperson language get to a yes or get to a no faster yeah and it's not just any yes or any no it's an aligned yes and it's an understandable no meaning right. you know why they said no because yeah. you can really pinpoint where was the gap between either what you were trying to accomplish or what the reasoning was behind why you were trying to accomplish it that way. Right. Um, really quick question. I love the second mouse gets the cheese thing because I'm a night owl and I hate <laughs> the early bird gets the worm concept because as a night owl, the second mouse does get the cheese, right? You know what I mean? So there is, there is a some, whole different the, buffet out there at night. <laughs> exactly. Um, what I, what I appreciate about what you just shared is it kind of lines into some of the principles that you talk about. I'm looking right, like principles set patterns, right? Like pattern recognition allows for efficiency right and then it leads to some of the stuff you're talking about when you what i also loved about the principles were that they were there is nuance that lives within them and it's it's hard not to see that and well thanks i appreciate that no i I, there are oh my gosh i spent literally 27 hours on the 27 sentences that the nine principles and their two sentence summaries you know it took that took the most time of right. the whole book was just right. getting those nine principles. Well, well, to, and to me, I think it's, which is why when I was going through the book, like you don't have to go through it in this linear fashion because when someone is going, I need to explore this more, they have to be in, it's uh, the, the idea of set and setting, right? Like they have to be in the right mindset to go, okay, oh, I, you know, I'm dealing with, for example, principle seven, when two truths conflict, only one can win. I need to be in the right mindset before I explore that, because if I'm feeling antagonistic, probably not going to help me when I'm going through that, unless I'm willing to let that aside. Do you you know what I mean? Yep, absolutely. So, so when you said it wasn't a framework, which, you know, I think principles and, and I mean, I'm, I'm being fast and loose and, and taking some Liberty there. Um, I, why, why did you, why were you so, um, emphatic or, or sure? 
That, and I guess it is fair. I no mean, principle because principle, but it, so there. I think that that principles does give you that wiggle room for nuance to exist in, yeah. whereas frameworks are like you were talking about, like a sales call. Like I've done enough sales call training where it's like, okay, here's the formula, here's the template, get that down, get those fundamentals down, because because then you can deal with the other side of the conversation. In yeah. this case, it's you, the other side of the conversation. This is preparing you for many other sides of conversations and many other sides of situations, right? Right. It's it's the that's why I would say to me it's not a it's not a it's not a framework in the sense that it is it is is like it's like the core elements and when the core elements come together they create you know other things and right. that you know where they you know the things they come together to create can be frameworks. Um, but these are to me like the core elements of that. I mean, I this past summer I started a, a doctoral program in adult learning and leadership, and you know, one of the because that's really all about how adults come to understand something. How do right. they how they learn? Um, and since I'm all about new ideas, and you that's requires learning in order to either even explain one. Um, I was really interested in it. And so in adult learning, there's a lot of conversation about this idea of kind of the collection of principles that guide, right? The, mm -hmm. Whatever you think. So in that sense, the closest we get to framework is what's known as a frame of reference, meaning it's kind of taken together. Think of it like a screen in front of your window. Mm -hmm. Like you can see through it. And actually, like when you're it, you actually don't really perceive that it's there because you can see through it. But if you were to reach out and touch it, you're like, oh here's this thing that's actually, you know, affecting and I'm screening everything that I'm seeing literally through this frame of reference. Mm -hmm. So what I was trying to do with the book really is kind of is, is argue kind of following my meta way, following presenting an argument for having this as a frame of reference when you, when you are set about to create change. And you know, I, as I say in the book, I mean, I am distinguishing from when you're just trying to get someone to do something once, right. um, because there's plenty of advice out there. It works. Uh, the problem is, is that some of the stuff that works to get someone to do something once is some of it's actually opposite of what's needed to get them to continue to do it. Right. And that again, has put my bent towards efficiency. I was like, all right, everyone's like, well, how do we retain more clients? How do we retain more donors? How do we, I'm like, well, don't take them off in the first place. <laughs> like, so that's where a lot of it came from. So I will think of it, I tend to think of it as a, like, this is, these are the elements of my frame of reference. Yeah, um, and he, like you said, an ecosystem, like an ecosystem, yeah, an ecosystem right? System. Right. You got it. Um, which of the principles do you feel mm -hmm. is the one that is the least maybe traditional or least um, accessible for people out of the gate where they have to, like, they, they may need to do by large more work <laughs> to like, Whoa. Well, they yeah. may just, they may just need to lean into it more than maybe some of the others. Cause some of them seem like, again, when I'm going through it, they're, they're like, okay, uh, this principle I, I can get behind. I just need to, you know, sharpen the saw a bit. But there's others like I don't even have a saw for this. So how do I? How do I? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, I, and it was interesting when I had advanced readers of the books, which because I I passed this through a lot of people. I had six peer reviewers, and then I went through like thirty beta re reviewers because I really wanted it to be as useful as possible to as many people as possible. And you know, I had one reviewer. Uh, who was like, I wish it were either shorter or longer and longer in that they wish that the, all the how to was in there. And I was like, but that defeated my purpose of like a short readable book. Mm -hmm. And then they, you know, shorter. And I'm like, but if it were any shorter, you wouldn't have believed any of this stuff. So I actually had to put all that stuff in there. So I'm like, I'm sanguine. It's the right length. Right. I mean, it's 28,000 words. It's not that no, long. Actually. I designed no. it to be like three hours or less, but right, I right, still but answered <laughs> no, no, but but really quickly, we'll come back to it. But but the idea of putting how tos, there is a permanence to a book, right? There is a I mean, yes, you can update Kindle versions and all that stuff. But to me, the why to is for that. And then like follow up blog posts and things that you can modify and workshops. That's where the how because the how to to me. And again, I'd love to hear your thoughts. The how to is everyone is at a different place. So you're, yes. you can't start 
from wherever. Whereas with the Y2, everyone is starting at the same spot because they're hearing the message from you in that in that way. Right. Yeah. And yes, and I and I built in the how to in the kind of my big project, other project of this year, which is I founded what I'm calling the Message Design Institute, and that's taking these fra- like these <laughs> frameworks, frameworks, processes, templates, et cetera, that I've developed. It's what the principles turn into. It's what they support, right? Um, so that people can go and say, "Oh, well, this is interesting," and they can find the red thread, but they can also now find uh, the how to that's associated with more of what you see in this book and that serves as a first step before you get to a red thread. Right. Um, so, you know, to your question of it, which one do I think is kind of countercultural? I'm going to interpret yeah, it that way. Yeah. I mean, I would think actually there's, there's two in my mind that are neck and neck and that would be principles five and six. Um, uh, well, four, five, and six really represent the three principles that represent what I see as the most common pitfalls for creating actual change for mm-hmm. people. So four being identity is the greatest influencer. That one's the quick, the quick version of that is that every human wants to be seen as smart, capable, and good. And a lot of times when we're presenting a change, often unintentionally, we are making them feel as if they are not smart, not capable, or not good for not having figured this out already. It's where the ego um, can take a hit, right? Oh, absolutely. And and again, they may temporarily say yes so that you that, that they perceive that you'll think of them that way. But ultimately, again, identity is the greatest influencer. Their self-concept won't allow that long term that they that they weren't acting in a smart way. Right. Um, so neck and neck to me are the other two as well. Uh so I think the one that is on the surface most countercultural is that pain is the enemy of long-term change. That's the one where I have I feel like I have to undo a lot of work that has been done by mm-hmm. particularly sales methodologies. Um, and it was one of the reasons why I was frankly like silly proud that the co-author of the Challenger Sale gave me my cover blurb for the book. Right. Because like in a lot of ways, the challenger sale could represent exactly the opposite of what I'm talking about there, um, which is the whole concept of like, I had, I had someone say to me on a workshop one time, she's like, well, my job is to make them sick so I can make them well. And I was like, and you don't, and to, I'm thinking to myself, and to my, you're, oh, wait, wait, you don't hear anything wrong with that? I'm thinking to myself. Um, so the thing is, is like, back to what we're talking about, actually. Sure. You know, I say like pain is in fact the ally of quick action. If something hurts, like you won't, you won't do it. You know, you'll move, you'll change something so that it, that it hurts. Um, but there's, there's deeper layers to that. And the first is, is that if you're in pain, if you're fearful, if you are anxious, all of the things that a lot of times we've been told to do to like up the stakes so that someone will really understand that they'll be ready to, to, to move. We've actually moved somebody into which known as the you know an anxious brain state, right? So, um, you know, Daniel Kahneman would call that system one. Yeah. Um, but you know, all sorts of people know that you know, adult learning included, that an anxious brain can't learn. So you may act, but you're not acting rationally. And so, a lot of times, that quick action that you get because someone's like, "Stop the pain." Mm-hmm gets undone when they're in a calmer mode and they can really think it through. And they're like, well, wait a minute. Like either like, I'm not the dumb one you are like, or I'm not the, you know, inane one you are, um, or something else will happen. So this is where I come back and say, you know, it it is the ally of quick action, but it's the enemy of long-term change. Like what will work better over time? What does work better over time? What I have seen work better over time is resonating with someone's pain, helping them understand why they are experiencing it, like empathize with them, sympathize with them, be compassionate with them for that pain because it is uncomfortable and then help them reduce that pain. So it's really about reframing to reduce pain, not only in the moment, but over time. And I think that one's probably the one that is, you know, like first out of the gate, that's the one where people are like, well, that I'm supposed to, but we're supposed to. And I'm like, Okay. Yeah, it works, but it depends on what you're trying to get as a result. Sure. We'll circle back to five because I know that that's another one, which and all of these are like, as I'm looking at them, they're not only related, like if you were to go them in sequential order, but also like they're 
they're wrapped up together. There's a nice little, um, when you were talking about Kahneman there really quickly, and then you, you finished your point about the idea of pain and, and that idea of let it resonating so that it's lessened over time. I, yeah. I, I couldn't help but think about when Adam Grant had a conversation with Daniel Kahneman on his podcast, we'll link to it in the show notes where he talked about like the happiness, like everyone's promoting happiness in it. And Kahneman said, which was again, counterintuitive. He goes, I don't want more happiness. I want less misery. I'm mm-hmm. like, ah, because the, the, to me, the sustainable part is huge in, in my world of pro- yeah. pr- productiveness. It's like the, you hear about consistency all the time, but you can't be consistent with things you can't sustain. Right. It's, like you can't. Right. It sounds and, obvious. But like, if we stop and think about it, you're like, huh? Right. Huh? Well, because we all we also have this idea of the consistency means we do it every day. No, we don't. We do it every week. Well, consistency can be like the seventh of every month or your yes. birthday is consistent. Right. Like, I mean, right. yeah, but you need right. to figure out what what you can sustain that like kind of like Goldilocks factor. And yeah. and when I heard but we you know, so happiness, happiness cannot exist unless there's sadness. So what we should be maybe striving for is contentment. Right. As opposed to because the happiness is the high and the sadness is the low. And then, of course, there's elements of that despair, elation like there. But yep. content there's is there another word for contentment that describes contentment? Maybe satisfied, but satisfied also maybe has a bit of a negative aspect to it. Like, well, I'm satisfied. Right. Like some yes. people can spin it that way, which, again, this is where I, I want to go into the the deep beliefs, because mm. that that's, that's we're, number five. We're, yep. Oh, that's and, the other and, one. And as we're <laughs> as we're recording this, um, we literally watched, and I don't typically get political on the on these episodes, but you have we live in a time where be- beliefs are so deep seated, a in 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 just you know the amount of information that we're asked to pay attention to really does a lot of kind of damage to to that in in, in kind of it reinforces some of the stuff that maybe isn't true or maybe it elevates us to thinking about that more than the things we actually have agency and control over yeah. but to me it, it it these deep beliefs um they are a, they're hard to shift in in so many places in in productivity and time management but yeah. also like i want to lean into why that long held beliefs because to me i looked at that and i'm like yeah that six and five dance together so well because oh, yeah. <laughs> Because <laughs> five right. is the long term stuff that's been sitting there, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that and it's interesting because I think, you know, there was a couple that were that that principles that, you know, first draft of the nine principles, they remained unchanged the whole right. time. Um, you know, every decision has a story. When two truths fight, only one wins. Both of those stayed and you can't want it more than they do. Those <laughs> those things just yep. stayed like as they were. Um, but getting to the right, or I think you should say the, the, the most intuitively accurate version of five, that the, the deepest beliefs, beliefs are the hardest to shift was actually pretty tough because it is, again, this is another counterintuitive one. Um, and because, and you are also correct in the fact that it is, it is, it is joined at the hip with pain as the enemy of long-term change, because what often happens is that you know, when we're trying to change ourselves or somebody else or whatever, we're like, well, if I'm trying to change behavior, we have this feeling that then therefore everything has to change. Right. Everything I do, everything I believe, maybe even who I am has to change. Um, But if we come back, we say identity is the greatest influencer and all these other things. What that means is, is that the things that we're trying to put out there are, you know, in, you know, weighed against these things that we've desired for a very long time. Um, these habits that we've built for a very long time, these beliefs that we've had for a very long time, these kind of new desires, these new beliefs tend to be super baby weak against them, against these 800 pound gorillas of stuff. And so while, again, at one level, it makes sense that if you're trying to change behavior, you need to change beliefs. As I say in the book, really what I've seen happen, and this has been as much informed by individual transformational change as anything else, is that it's actually about swapping out this pre-existing strong belief that's getting in the way with a pre-existing just as strong or stronger belief, right, that actually supports the change. And so when that happens, you know, we, we're able to kind of align and check the box against a bunch of other things. A, 
identity is the greatest influencer. I don't have to change who I am to change what I do. Right. Uh, pain is the enemy of a long-term change. Okay. It's not going to be painful because this, this is just something else that I believe to be true. And I'm moving that into play in here because I really do want this thing, right? I want this thing that's out there. So, you know, and I'm deeply interested in that because as I, you know, just as I baby toe dip my, you know, baby dip my toes in the water, you're trying I'm in communication. Can you tell? <laughs> um, geez, geez, geez. Yeah. When I, you know, I've just started. Here, let's start it. There you go. Uh, with my doctoral research, like this is actually what I'm really interested in. I love that you asked about frames of reference because it are it's it is these deep seated principles that I'm deeply interested in because there is a there is a range between these these you know identity based beliefs that let's say right now are easily identified by in groups, right? In group beliefs, whether that's political or cultural or socioeconomical or whatever, right? That there's, those are super strong and those are where all much of that polarization is happening. And then way deep down, there are these primal beliefs that I talk about in the book that are binary and mm -hmm. don't really change. And we, based on the early research, seem to be pretty much born with them. Um, but there are, there's this whole set of stuff that happens in between. Like, you know, things like what goes up must come down. Most of us believe that germs are the cause of disease and that gravity explains why we don't go flying off into the universe. So there are these things. There's even cultural beliefs like that. So that just about every culture, every religion, every philosophy has some equivalent concept to treat people the way that you want to be treated and vice versa, right? Um so there is this range of beliefs that is that have been around just as long, maybe even longer, mm -hmm. and are kind of more true in more areas than these these higher level beliefs. And so, uh, and from what I've found so far, and if anybody listening is aware of other research that I haven't found yet, please send it my way. We haven't really stratified those in a way or really figured out a, a way to get to them. But I believe deeply is probably as evident, like thinking back through the book with that lens on, that they are the key to getting a new thing, an unfamiliar behavior to feel very, very familiar. Um, and it's those kinds of flips where you're just bringing in something else that you either already believe to be true or just like notches into your ecosystem like of belief really well that you're like, oh, well, that makes sense. And since this other thing isn't working for me in this area, let me let me try how this one will work in this area. But because it's also strong, it's much more likely to survive, right? When it's mm -hmm. called when it's put when it's put to the test. Tamsin, we, I'd love to chat more, but I know I want to be respectful of your time and also of the listener's time. Now, I will say really quickly, what I love about the book is you've applied timelessness to the book as well as timely elements. Thank you. That is exquisite in terms of being able to allow, because it's really, well, there's, because you, we want more timeless reads out there. I want to be able to, like, I'm reading books from the 80s and 70s. And I'm like, okay, some of these, that's what I look for is we hear timely all the time, but ultimately the same things. That's why stoicism is so big because the same, the things that mattered then and, and worked then they tend to still work now. Why are yeah. we seeing remakes of movies? Same reason, right? That's like, right. Story Listen, is story. <laughs> both, both of my main frameworks are Aristotle. So yeah, like there you you're, you're preaching to the choir. So, yeah. <laughs> um, where can people keep up with you and your work and where can they pick up the book? Say what they can't on here. The nine principles. All right. Of they Lasting should change. be able to get, say what they can't on here. The nine yep. principles of lasting change anywhere that books are sold. Um, but if they want to find like extra goodies, downloads, incentives for getting more then they can go to littlechangebook.com. Um, again, that's littlechangebook.com. Um, and actually, you know, just to, just to get people a sense of where to get started, I'm actually, I've also created a little URL to, for, for folks to have just to get a sense to start making these cases for change on their own. So they can go to the compact case up.com. So the compact case.com, uh, download a quick little worksheet. And, you know, so that's the, 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 how to do this, uh, and say what they can't done here, here is the why. Tamsin, thanks so much for having a productive conversation with me today. What a pleasure, Mike. Thank you. Thanks to Tamsin for joining me on the program today. You can 
check out all the relevant show notes on the website, mikevardy.com slash podcast 549. But you can also check out the show notes and all the relevant links wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribing to the show is one way to make the show better, help out the show. Just subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, be it Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, That way you won't miss a single episode of what's to come, including our Flashback Friday episodes, the monthly PM talk series, and so much more. That's it for this episode of A Productive Conversation. Don't forget to support the show also by checking out the sponsors that you heard during today's conversation. You can go to mikevardy.com slash podcast sponsors to check them out. But until next time, I'm Mike Vardy, the host of A Productive Conversation, reminding you to stop doing productive and start being productive. See you later.